All right then, Econ friends, welcome back for another section of videos. In this set of videos, we're turning our attention to another market structure. This one on the opposite side of the continuum from PC, this is the market structure called monopoly. We're gonna start with some definitions, talk about barriers to entry, which is how monopolies become and stay monopolies, really important. And then from there, we'll go through our traditional analysis, asking questions about how monopolies determine price and quantity to maximize profits. And then we'll cover some of the welfare and the efficiency aspects of monopoly, okay? So let's jump in with some definitions and an intro. And we start off by defining monopoly as a market structure with a single seller of a product, so monopoly again implies one seller. It's a market structure. There's a single seller of a product. Critically, that product has to have no close substitutes. So the monopoly is defined as a market structure where there's one seller and that seller is selling a product with no close substitutes. And critically, the market structure is characterized by having what we would call high barriers to entry. So you can contrast this definition with the definition that we put forth before for perfect competition, okay? To recap it, a monopoly is a market structure, one seller selling a good with no close substitutes in an environment characterized by high barriers to entry. As we said before, you can think of monopoly as being on the opposite side of the continuum from perfect competition. It really is sort of an opposite. And therefore what we're gonna do is not just dissect monopoly by itself, but also try to compare and contrast monopoly outcomes with PC outcomes, okay? Now, you hear the word monopoly a lot. It's important to understand that in the real world, you know, near monopoly conditions rarely well, near monopoly conditions do exist, okay? Levels of market power do exist. Absolutely pure monopoly is really rare. So a lot of times purists will say, well, there's really no pure as defined monopoly. Well, that may or may not be true, but the bigger issue for us and the real big takeaway is while absolutely pure monopoly might be rare, near monopoly conditions do exist. And since the number of situations where those conditions exist is numerous, it makes the study of monopoly really important, okay? We don't have to always see pure monopoly to benefit from studying monopoly, understanding how they operate, seeing their impact. And critically, studying monopoly is really useful in helping us to clarify and really lock in those desirable aspects, especially the efficiency aspects that we saw in perfect competition, okay? We don't have to have pure monopoly, you know, pure by definition monopoly everywhere. Just seeing close approximations is sufficient to give us an idea of where they fail and what impact that has on society. And that really helps us lock in those desirable aspects that we studied in perfect competition, okay? So that's our overview and our definition. One of the first things you have to understand when it comes to monopoly is why they exist. In other words, how does the monopoly become the monopoly? How does the monopoly stay the monopoly? And the real critical takeaway here is that monopolies operate and emerge due to what we call barriers to entry. Now we've studied this and discussed it a little bit before. We'll go into some more detail now. But monopolies exist due to what we call barriers to entry. You can think of these barriers to entry effectively as obstacles that prevent other firms from entering into the industry. You can think of it like a series of moats, right? That prevent profit-seeking firms from coming in. They just can't do it. They're blocked out. The barriers are too high, okay? As a result of these barriers, it's important to understand that, that monopolists, they really face 
no competition. And as an extension, they really don't face the immediate threat of competition. Okay, so it's a totally different structure. When we talk about the barriers to entry, it's useful to kind of classify them or segment them or break them down to really kind of wrap your head around them. So let's think about barriers as one of two types. We can either have what we're gonna call natural barriers or we're gonna have what we call government created barriers. They both, at the end of the day, allow monopolies to emerge and exist, but it's useful to understand them by sort of breaking them up. So the first type, what we call natural barriers, these are the barriers that can just exist or emerge naturally within a market itself, okay? So natural barriers, they're just kind of part of economic structures. They either exist there or they have the potential to exist just as part of the way that markets are built. There's a couple of types of natural barriers. One of the first and the most important one is known as economies of scale. Now you may recall this from our discussion of long run average total cost curves. Economies of scale, that term refers to any situation in which long run average costs, in other words, long run ATC, in which those costs decline as the output of the firm expands. In other words, when you have economies of scale, as the firm produces more output, their ATC falls. And this has some pretty important implications. When economies of scale are extremely large, and typically this exists because there are really high fixed costs. This you see in things like technology and things like utilities, you know, in, in industries or areas where you have really, really high fixed costs, really high startup costs, you're often going to also find very large economies of scale. If this happens, monopolies can emerge. And here's the real critical thing to keep in mind. The monopoly can emerge because it is less costly for just one firm to produce the entire market's output than for two or more smaller competing firms to do it. Okay, the nature of economy of scale is as output expands, ATC falls. Therefore, when this exists, it's gonna be less expensive, less costly for one firm to supply all of the market's output than for multiple firms. And as a result, that one firm will emerge, its lower costs will give it a price advantage that no other firm can match, blocking those firms out, leading to monopoly, okay? Critically, this situation is known in economics by the term natural monopoly. And this is really important to understand natural monopoly. You can see right here a brief illustration. You see that we have on this axis cost and on this axis quantity, meaning output. And as you can see, we have this thing sloping downward. Okay, this is the economy of scale region. And the takeaway is really clear. The more quantity that a firm produces, the more it falls lower and lower on its ATC and the lower its costs go. We conclude by understanding that in this kind of market, and again, this is gonna emerge whenever you have a high fixed cost structure, right? High, um, high operating cost to start things up. ATC will be reduced and lowered by having a single firm. And in a way, that's going to benefit consumers. Because think about the opposite. If instead you had many firms, you would be operating not down here on your ATC curve, but you know, higher up here. You have more firms, those firms are splitting the market's output, each firm sells less. We're going to be moving our quantity back this way, moving up the curve, 
and pushing our ATCs higher. And in fact, in a situation of economy of scale, having many firms will actually raise overall cost in the industry. And that implies usually that consumers have to pay higher cost. Okay, so our first and really important barrier, economy of scale. Another barrier to entry, control of an important resource. Or seen a different way, control of another input. Remember, production processes, you take raw materials, resources, inputs, the factors of production, and you convert those to finished products. Well, if a company is able to secure control of an important resource, then they're able to monopolize production, okay? A third potential barrier is difficulty in raising capital. Now it's important right now that we take a quick segue. We're not talking here about capital in the pure economic form of land labor capital. We're not talking here about factories or machines. Instead, in this type of barrier, we're talking about financial capital. And financial capital effectively refers to the amount of money that a firm can raise. Remember, firms are always spending they're investing, they're building factories. Oftentimes they have to borrow money, usually in loanable funds markets, which we've learned about, okay? We refer to this as financial capital. So clearly having access to financial capital, having access to loans gives a firm an advantage because if a firm can get easy capital, really inexpensive, low interest rate capital, that firm can do lots of great things to build up more barriers, to build up more moats, to insulate themselves from competition, okay? There's lots of examples of this. We'll talk about some during live lecture. But the big takeaway is new firms, potential entrants into a market, oftentimes have difficulty in raising capital. You may have a great idea for a product. You may have a great idea to take on an existing monopoly. But if you cannot get the loans that you need, especially if your startup costs are high, if you cannot raise capital effectively, you're not going to be able to make those initial investments to enter that industry and compete. So difficulty in raising capital oftentimes stifles competition. And at the same time, in this weird double whammy, existing monopolies can oftentimes raise capital very easily. So at the same time that potential entrants cannot get access to funds, the existing monopolies oftentimes have pretty easy access to capital, often at low interest rates. And this, of course, allows them to take actions to reinforce those barriers that they already have, and sometimes they even put up more barriers. You can imagine a business strategy where you think, if I can get cheap capital, I can take steps and put together programs or pricing structures or whatever. I can take these strategic steps with all this inexpensive capital to block out my rivals, okay? So we see that, we see this double whammy where new firms have difficulty raising capital sometimes and existing monopolies can raise it easily, thereby reinforcing those moats and those barriers, stifling competition, okay? So we have control of a resource, difficulty in raising capital. Another potential natural barrier would be brand loyalty. There are some industries where there is really, really intense brand loyalty. And if existing customers in an industry have a lot of brand loyalty, it can be sort of hard for new entrants to enter the market. This also is why you notice lots of firms, they expend lots of money in advertising, in branding. They're doing these things, they're taking these steps to foster and increase brand loyalty. This makes it much more difficult for new firms to enter, okay? So brand loyalty. And a final natural 
barrier is what we're going to call network externalities. Network externalities are an increasingly important economic phenomena. You see, once you understand what they are, you see them all over the place. Okay, let's first define it. A network externality can be seen as the benefits that you get from a good or a service as a result of other people also using the same good or service. Okay, so a network externality occurs any time an item's value increases as more people use the item. Think about social media. If only one person were on it, it would mean nothing. But for each additional person who uses a social media platform, the platform becomes more valuable. In fact, a lot of today's technology firms, they build their entire market plans, their entire you know, business strategies around exploiting network externalities. They want to get as many people as possible to use that platform because the more people that use the platform, the more valuable the platform becomes and the harder it is for new platforms, okay, new competitors to emerge. That's also a reason why easy access to capital is really important for a monopoly. And difficulty in capital can hurt competition because one of the ways that firms build network externalities is to add more features to their products to make their products more valuable so that as more people use them, they become even more valuable and you get this cycle that spirals and continues allowing the existing company to really lock in monopoly power because it's able to block out any sucker rival entrance, okay? So we have a handful of natural barriers. Our second category would be government created barriers which we can also call legal barriers, okay? Government-created barriers, AKA legal barriers, these refer to either the intentional or oftentimes unintentional result of government policies. So whereas natural barriers are just part and parcel of how a market operates, government-created barriers stem from government policies. One of the common ones that you're familiar with would be things like patents and copyrights. Patents and copyrights, these are laws passed by government, right? So they're government created. Patents and copyrights are laws that protect the sellers of an item from facing what you can call copycat competition. You invent a product, you invent a process, you record a song, you patent something, you have the exclusive right to use it, protected by law, right? That's property rights. This goes back to our idea from earlier lectures of property rights. If you have a patent or a copyright, that item is yours and nobody else can use it or sell it unless you allow them to and therefore you get some monopoly power out of that. Really quickly, a patent is a temporary exclusive right to the use of a product that is given to its inventor. Okay, so a patent is given to the inventor of a product and the patent gives that inventor or that inventor's company the sole exclusive right to sell that product. Once you have a patent on a product, other companies can't just come and sell your product and undercut you. No, you have a government protected monopoly for the length of your patent, okay? A copyright is basically the same thing, at least in, in, in theory and substance, except that a copyright, instead of protecting an invention, a copyright simply protects you know, creative stuff like books and films and music, okay? But either way, if you hold a patent or a copyright, you are protected from competition. People can't just copy your invention, your process, your song, your script. You own it, you have monopoly protection. 
Another form of this is what we're going to call licensing. Licensing refers to a situation in which the government gives one firm, and here's what's critical, the exclusive right. The sole right to sell a product or provide a service. You see this a lot with things like utilities, but you also see it in some cities with things like, um, uh, there's a lot of examples. Uh, back before cell phones, when we had more hardline phones, you would have protected hardline areas. You'll sometimes see in some cities that government will issue licenses to operate cabs, for example. You'll see in some cities that governments issue licenses to give one firm the exclusive right to do, for example, garbage pickup and sanitation, okay? Licensing is a situation where the government gives one firm a legally protected sole exclusive right to sell a product or provide a service. And because this is backed up by government, and therefore by the force of law, it's a really strong moat, a really high barrier to provide monopoly power, okay? At the end of the day, we have these two. We have market-created and government-created barriers, though they occur for different reasons. And I want you to know what each type is. The end result is really the same. They lead to the creation of monopoly power, okay? And therefore, that's how monopolies come into being, and that's how they stay in existence. There's one more thing I wanted to bring up when it came to barriers to entry. You'll recall in our PC discussion that we had said that if there were profits, that would be an incentive for firms to enter. And we discussed that short run to long run adjustment process, you recall. We had said that in the long run, the presence of profits would drive new firms in, which would increase supply, which would lower price, which would reduce and eliminate those profits. That's not the case in monopoly. Really important to understand and take away that these barriers to entry, yes, they imply that monopolies can earn economic profits, but critically, the barriers to entry suggest and imply that the monopoly's profits, that they can be sustained over time. Again, in perfect competition, it was entry and exit that got us to a long run equilibrium with zero economic profit. But because by definition, barriers to entry block entry, block competition, not only can monopolies make profits, but those profits can be sustained over time. So that, my friends, is our intro to monopoly and barriers to entry. In our next video, we'll jump into those critical decisions of P and Q and ATC, and we'll figure out how monopolies maximize profits. I'll see you in a bit.